Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this ShareSock and Yellowstone webinar with Halma. Um, I'm Mike Dennis. I'm one of ShareSock's directors, and I'll take you through the first part of today's webinar. Um, just before we kick off completely, just the usual boilerplate as a reminder that we as ShareSock are not um, authorized to give you individual investment advice. So everything you see today is information that we hope will help you in terms of managing your own portfolio, but any investment decisions are clearly your own. So uh, here we go with the, the main event. We've got Charles King today. I'd like to welcome Charles, who's the head of investor relations for Halma. Charles is going to take you through the presentation and then he will uh, be joined by Alex at the end for, for the questions. So welcome, Charles, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. And there will be the usual technical pause just while I share my screen and uh, just double check with you, Mike, if, uh, if I can, that you can see that screen uh, at yep, your that's end. Coming, coming across clearly, yes, no problems. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for joining. It's great to have so many people online um, and uh, great to have so, many, so much interest both from shareholders and non-holders as well. Um, so I hope I can be useful in, in educating you or updating you on Halma today. Um, just a brief word about me before we kick off. I'm, as you can see, I'm the head of investor relations. I joined Halmer about three years ago, actually, as the first ever head of investor relations for Halmer as we moved into the FTSE 100. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we've now moved pretty much to the FTSE 50 now. So we're pretty much bang in the middle of the FTSE 100 in terms of market capitalization, which is obviously very nice progression. My contact details are there. If you need to contact me after this with any specific questions, do feel free to do so. Um, in terms of my career, I, this is Halmer is actually the seventh company I've done investor relations for. Uh, some of the, the other companies before Halmer you'll be familiar with, um, Cadbury's, Tate and Lyle, uh, Lloyd's Banking Group post the financial crisis where I ran the team and, uh, and helped sell down about seven and a half billion pounds worth of government stock, uh, obviously fairly successfully there. And then most recently at a company called WorldPay, uh, which you'll probably know from those terminals that are everywhere that will take, take your money off you in, uh, in various shops. But uh, very happy to be at Halma and, uh, and, uh, and to be part of the, the successful trends that we're seeing in the business overall. So let's talk about those. What have we delivered over the last 10 years? And as you can see, there's been a very strong and consistent track record, both of revenue and profit over that period of time. Uh, we've delivered um, an 11% compound annual growth rate of revenue and a 12% compound annual growth rate of profit. So pretty much very similar at both levels of the P&L. Um, and what I'd like to do today is just show you in, in about 10 slides how we've achieved that. So a little bit about what Halma is. It may not be a familiar name to, to all of you. As you can see, we're a global group of life-saving technology companies. We're about 7,000 people uh, operating in about 20 countries and selling into over 50 countries and delivering products that save people's lives. And those products are in three areas, as you can see there, safety, protecting life in industrial processes and in commercial and public spaces. The environment, that cleaner piece of our, our purpose, saving lives by ensuring that we have a cleaner world and protecting our scarce natural resources. And then health, um, our, our medical division saves lives and improves the quality of life by diagnosing and treating diseases. We're over 40 companies uh, and our strategy is to grow those companies over the long term and acquire new companies in our chosen areas of safety, health and the environment. And we look for market niches, as you can see there, with superior growth and global potential where we can have a leadership position and grow those markets over time. And what markets do we like? Well, we, we like markets that, as you can see, have resilient long term regulatory and demographic growth drivers. And just to put a bit of color around that, we benefit over the long term from growing, aging and urbanizing populations and from ever increasing regulation. And we think those growth drivers are common around the world 
and will we'll sustain our growth over the long term. Just a little bit about what we do and uh, a few of just picking a few of the things we do. You can read the slide there and get a, an idea of the scale and breadth of the business, uh, but just picking a few out of each area. Uh, fire detection is one of our biggest businesses. Um, and uh, when I uh, and we we have businesses in the UK, Europe, the US, Australia, for example, focused on fire detection. And um, when we add all of those up uh, and and look at the coverage that we have and the scale of the of the positive impact we have in fire detection and keeping people safe, we did a calculation last year and worked out that our fire detectors cover an area that's twice the size of Luxembourg. So making a lot of buildings a lot safer um, around the world. In Cleaner, one of our key businesses is in water. Uh, and we, we uh, one of our businesses based in South Wales, HWM, is a business that's focused on leak detection and pressure monitoring for UK water companies. And that may sound very technical, but actually what it means is that we stop the leaks that you may see from day to day um, in, in the water pipes. And actually through doing that, saving billions of gallons of water each year for UK water companies, and obviously therefore protecting that increasingly scarce natural resource, uh, and also making sure that those networks are much more efficient. And then in healthier, um, I, I, I won't go into the detail of what we do. You can see some of the some of the areas there, but just to say the scale of the business again is, is large. We support over 7 million operations each year with our products. So again, you know, fantastic positive impact on the world. How do we create value? It's really a combination of these five factors. I've already talked a bit about our strong purpose, that purpose to make the world safer, cleaner and healthier for everyone every day. Um, and that, that, that is our guiding light, our, our guiding principle for all of our business that determines everything we do. We have a clear strategy, uh, as I've talked about, to, to acquire and grow companies in those growth markets. And the financial model I'll come into shortly. It, and, and both of those are very clear, very simple, uh, and, and are really sustaining factors for the business overall. We set ourselves challenging targets as well. Uh, we look to double the size of the business in terms of profitability every five years. And that, that means that we aspire to, to, to a 15% compound annual growth rate. As you've already seen, we don't quite get there. So we probably double it every six years, but we set ourselves that challenging aspiration to double the size of the business every five years. Um, and, and that's what we aspire to do. And all of that's backed up by a very robust organization and culture. We're entrepreneurial, we're decentralized, we, we're very accountable for our performance in the business overall. And yet we're also, despite that decentralization, we're very collaborative uh, uh, in terms of our culture. So when you join Halma, you realize that, that people are very supportive um, and very and, and, and willing to help contribute to your success in the business overall. So those five factors together, we believe drive that long-term success that we see in the business. How do we grow? Well, really there are three, three main growth engines or growth strategies that we look at within the business. I've already talked a bit about the core, acquiring and growing those companies in niche global markets, which have long-term growth drivers. Then we also think uh, on top of that, there are increasingly new opportunities to bring Halma technologies together to develop new products and services. And we call that convergence. So that's taking technologies from each of our individual companies, bringing them together to create a new product, a new technology, a new service for our companies. And one example of that recently that we're, that we're developing uh, at the moment, in fact, is a, is a product called Scope which looks at safety in, in logistics warehouses. As you can imagine, they're pretty busy places at the moment, given that everyone's buying online. And we're using technology from our process safety sector, uh, interlock technology to keep, uh, to, to keep those, uh, those warehouses safe. We're using technology from our medical sector to track assets and people around those warehouses. 
and we're using technology from our infrastructure safety sector, radar technology, to manage the uh, movement of, of trucks around the yards in logistics warehouses to make that as efficient and as safe as possible. So great contributions to efficiency, but really dr drawing together that technology from right across the organization to create a new product that, that really focuses on, on, on addressing the need for efficiency and safety for our logistics customers. And then increasingly, we're also looking to digitalize our products, making use of data and remote monitoring, for example, to enhance the offering to customers. And we, we call that edge. So developing and investing in those digital business models that, that really will, uh, we think, ultimately disrupt the way everyone does business. I've talked a little bit about the, the, the decentralized nature of the group and the fact that we have over 40 companies who each act individually and autonomously, autonomously in their separate marketplaces. That might raise the question about, well, what's the role of the group um, in, 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 in bringing those companies together? And we see our role as helping our companies to grow over the long term and to help with the challenges that, uh, that, that, that our companies and frankly, any small and mid-sized company has, um, for example, how to grow overseas, how to get the best people in the organization, how to innovate and create those new digital business models that I talked about, and how to do um, M&A transactions, for example, as well, if you want to do bolt-on transactions um, to, 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 uh, to build your business and build your capabilities within the business. So we have seven small central teams you can see here. Uh, we've set them out uh, on this slide. We call them growth enabler teams. And as I say, their role is to enable the growth of our businesses over the long term and help them overcome those challenges. And this is really like a menu of help that our companies can access to keep them growing over the long term. I mentioned our financial model, um, and uh, this, this slide sets out how we see our financial model. So starting first at the left-hand side, what are the characteristics of a typical Halma business? So I've already talked about the markets that we, we operate in with those resilient long-term growth drivers and the fact that they're niche markets which offer, offer superior growth to the broader market areas that we operate in. Our Halma businesses, as, as, as I've already mentioned as well, have strong market and product positions within those niches. So they're typically one, two or three in those markets and they have leading products that address those customers' needs. And importantly, they also have relatively low capital intensity. Um, so we're, 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 we, we don't have heavy manufacturing within the business. We're basically a pretty much a final fix manufacturer in a, in a simple form. What does that mean financially? That means that we have strong organic revenue and profit growth. Um, so strong top line momentum coming out of those long term growth drivers. We have a high return on sales, so healthy margins, a good return on capital, which is well above the cost of capital. So most recently we reported a return on capital for the last financial year of 15.3%. That's a post-tax return on total invested capital. And that compares to a, a cost of capital that's roughly around half that level. So we're, we're earning returns that are double our cost of capital. And because we're relatively low capital intensity, we have very strong cash uh, and we have high margins, we have very strong cash generation, and we keep the, the, the leverage modest as well to enable us to continually invest in the business over the, over the long term. And all of that means that we can support high levels of spend on R&D and innovation to keep that organic growth engine going. And in a fairly long product lifecycle company like Halma, we're spending about five and a half percent of our revenues on R&D each year. So we're well invested in keeping our products up to date and addressing those, those important customer needs for safety, health and, 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 and a cleaner environment. Our second priority then is to, is to grow through value enhancing acquisitions. And about half our growth comes from, from acquisitions, about half comes from organic growth. So we have a self-funded um, uh, process of, 
of 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 buying small uh, relatively small bolt on companies and and uh, and 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 companies in adjacent markets that we can um, that we can uh, that, 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 that are consistent with our business model so we're looking to buy good successful businesses in those core areas of safety health and the environment in markets that we know relatively well or adjacent or are adjacent to markets that we know well and then the third priority is dividends. So having invested in organic growth, having invested in, in, in growth through acquisitions, we can also pay a dividend. And we have a very substantial track record of dividend growth. It's actually, we've now grown the dividend by 5% or more for more than 40 years, in fact, 41 years. Um, and that's obviously a very strong signal of the health and growth within the business overall. So the last last box on the right hand side there, as you can see, continuous reinvestment in our businesses is really the key to our success, both in, or, in terms of organic growth and in terms of acquired growth. And that's what drives that shareholder return over a long period of time. So coming back to that slide and, and filling it out a bit more, there's the same charts on revenue and adjusted profit before tax that you saw right at the beginning of this presentation. You can see that healthy level of R&D expenditure, which has grown broadly in line with revenue over, the, over a period of time, perhaps actually a little bit more than revenue. So we're healthily invested um, in the business. And you can see that return on total invested capital well above our weighted average cost of capital overall. Then just looking at the most recent set of results we put out in November for the half year, um, obviously that was the, the, the half year to September the 30th last year. So included in the first quarter, the, 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 the uh, significant impacts that we saw from COVID um, in that April to June period. And you can see that it was a pretty resilient performance. Uh, revenue and profit uh, declined by 5% each. We maintained our margins at 19.7%, so that return on sales at 19.7%. And um, we managed to also, at the same time, ensure that we preserved liquidity and a strong balance sheet. So net debt went down. Uh, as you can see there to 315 million pounds. We had nearly half a billion pounds of liquidity available, obviously very important in, in, in what was a more challenging environment than we'd normally seen. And all of that allowed our board to, again, increase our dividend by 5%. Um, so continuing that track record of dividend growth. And what we saw during that first half of the year is, is sequential revenue growth. So 11% from that very challenging first quarter uh, R&D spend remained healthy. And in terms of the acquired growth in the business, whilst we didn't make any acquisitions in the first half of the year to preserve liquidity, we saw plenty of activity. And actually, since the year end, we've made one acquisition and that activity remains high, plenty of active prospects, as, as you can see. Since that half year end, we've recently put out a trading update uh, just on Wednesday last week. And what we're now expecting for the year as a whole is for our adjusted profit before tax to be similar to the profit before tax that we reported last year. Uh, so we reported 267 million of profit before tax last year, and we're expecting about the same number this year. So obviously, you know, that momentum, that improvement that we, that we saw in the second quarter of the year has continued through into the second half of the year. Uh, and uh, we're just about to close the year end today um, and we'll report those results formally to you on June the 10th. So do look out for that and mark that as a, a date in your diary. I, I couldn't get away uh, without mentioning uh, the very topical uh, 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 topic of, of sustainability um, and ESG as it's termed. Um, this is, you know, I get asked a lot of questions about our sustainability strategy. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on that uh, now. And all of that is, is, is our sustainability strategy is really determined by that purpose, that very strong purpose we have of growing that safer, cleaner, healthier future for everyone every day. That's our guiding principle and really determines how we think about sustainability in the business. 
what we do is we structure our, our sustainability strategy around four key sustainable development goals that have been set by the United Nations. And you can see them there. Good health and well-being, obviously highly relevant to our medical business. Clean water and sanitation, very relevant to our environmental and analysis sector. And then the other two, industry innovation and infrastructure and, uh, and sustainable cities, very relevant to our safety sector. And our key areas of focus, well, what are they? You know, the environment clearly, you know, climate change is on, is, is on everyone's, is everyone's lips at the moment. And we are highly focused on having both a positive impact in terms of climate change and helping our customers reduce their climate impacts but also reducing our own impact. And we've got a great track record, for example, in reducing our carbon intensity over the last 10 years or so. And we're gonna continue that record uh, looking forward by setting what's known as a science-based target, which is aligned with the, uh, uh, aligned with the Paris Agreement. Um, so basically reducing, doing our part at Halma to, to help the world achieve um, a, a one and a half degree warming rather than anything more than that. We're also very focused on talent within the business. So diversity and inclusion is extremely important to us, making sure that we have the most inclusive, uh, making sure that Halma is as inclusive as possible to give us the most diverse and most talented workforce we think is, is, is very important. Uh, and we've made great strides there. Um, just to give you an idea, our PLC board by gender is 50-50 male, female. Um, and actually our executive board that sits below that, the, the, the people who run the business day to day um, is actually majority female. So in terms of gender, we've made great strides. And we're obviously also looking at uh, other measures of, of diversity as well. Ethnicity, for example, disability, et cetera, et cetera, to make Halma the most inclusive place it can be. So very simply, we get the best people. I'd also add to that, and it's not on the slide, but we're increasingly looking at the impact of our products in terms of the environment. So looking at product life cycle and product design to minimize the impact, minimize our use of natural resources within the business. And again, we think that the more we work at that, the more that makes Helma sustainable for the long term. And then finally on this side, we're very focused on on, on the communities where we operate um, and, and the impacts that we can have as a business. And we've run now um, uh, one charitable campaign, which was focused on, uh, which we call Gift of Sight, focused on, uh, on, on the, the work we do uh, in ophthalmology and more generally in eye health in, in our business. Uh, and that, that, uh, uh, that, that helped restore sight to, uh, to around 8,000 people um uh in some developing countries our latest campaign is water for life um, we're focused there on using some of our water technologies uh, particularly our water testing technologies uh, and raising money to support uh, some villages in india which are suffering from arsenic pollution particularly of their groundwater and and obviously that's extremely bad for health um and we are going to make an impact using um using our technologies to, to, to help them um, get clean water so that they're, 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 they're healthier overall. So just one way in which we can give back to the communities where we operate. Now, one final slide before we go over to Q&A. Obviously, the social piece of ESG, uh, environmental, social and governance, has been very important during the, the COVID crisis. And um, we, as you can see here, we've, we've made some significant steps uh, in terms of not, G, not least actually manufacturing PPE, PPE uh, that protective equipment uh, for, uh, for hospitals and communities, but also thinking about equity with our suppliers and other stakeholders in terms of payments, um, making sure that we, uh, that we follow very, uh, very well the, the health and safety and, and legal uh, requirements within the business and then thinking about supporting our employees as well uh, as they've been at home or they're working in different environments uh, and facing the challenges of COVID, making sure that they're, they're supported as much as we can. 
And in terms of diversity and inclusion, again, you can see that we've made some significant steps uh, with a new parental leave policy, for example, so 14 weeks um, for all parents, and that's on a global basis, uh, which is very unusual, I think, for, for, for many companies, given that uh, you know, we, we may be more used to some of those types of policies in, in the UK and Europe, um, but certainly in other, other areas like the US. Um, that can be uh, that that that's a bit more challenging in terms of parental leave policies and people return to work a lot quicker. So, some significant steps in supporting our employees, supporting our communities during the COVID crisis, and uh, and you know look, look out for further progress as as we move forward. That is is all i'm going to say formally so i'm going to turn it back to alex now um to grill me with some questions i see we've got a few on the on the on the q a already so uh, back to you alex well charles thank you very much for that very interesting uh, presentation it must be pretty exciting working for such an innovative company with it with such a strong track record so um i'm sure you're enjoying life there um, we are now open for Q&A. We've had a few questions come in. If you do want to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you like a question that you see already there, please um, put the uh, or upvote on it, the thumbs up, um, and those, uh, those questions will go to the top of the list and I'll try and address those in that order. So uh, let's start now, Charles, top of the list. Can you tell us a little bit about your worldwide reach where in the world Helma operates and percentage of income from those countries? Sure, absolutely. Um, so it's pretty simple, actually. About 75% of our business is in either the UK, Europe or the US. And it's pretty much 50-50 split, fairly roughly, between the US and the UK and Europe. Um, so that's that's fairly, that, 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 that's the, the biggest base of the business. In the remaining 25, um, we're operating in the biggest piece is Asia, um, and the biggest piece in Asia is China. So we've got a large business in China, which is probably Asia is about 15% of revenue overall, and, and China is about half of that 15%, again, very roughly. And then we also have businesses in the Middle East and in South America, for example. And as I mentioned, you know, even beyond that reach of 20 plus countries that we actually operate in, we're selling into probably 50, 50 plus countries around the world. So a really global operation. OK, got a Brexit related question here. To what extent has and will Brexit impact how much operations going forward? Yeah, I mean, for a bit of context, um, the the the. the the, the revenues that flow between the UK and the EU and vice versa for us are probably high single digit percents of revenue. So not hugely material in the overall context of the group, but individual companies within our 40 plus companies have certainly had to address some of the challenges of Brexit. Um, and those are you know, fairly obvious ones, supply chain, obviously making sure that we retain and grow our talent. Um, it's become a bit more difficult to recruit um, if you're a UK company for example, from the European Union, making sure that we've maintained product certifications. Um, but actually what we found is, is, is the agility of our companies has been a great asset. So each of our individual companies and its board of directors in, in each case has considered what the specific impacts are for that company in its particular marketplaces. Uh, they've set their own strategies based on that. We haven't told them what to do from the center. It's very much company by company, market by market. But in a very Halmer way, what we've done is support them with those challenges. So we formed a Brexit group, um, a very collaborative group. And I mentioned our collaborative culture that came together to address some of those, those, uh, those issues. Um, and we supported them with help from the center. So we had a, a, a core team of experts looking at Brexit and all of the potential impacts that you might see, and also supported them with external advice from consultants as well. So have we seen much impact? The answer is no, not really, but that's because we prepared very well. And we started you know, way back when in 2016, I think it was, um, looking at what might happen, looking at all of the various scenarios, looking at the, the issues we needed to address. And, that's, uh, and that stood us in good stead as we've gone through Brexit. Okay. Um, next question, given your high ROE, which is well in excess of the cost of capital, 
why do you pay out a dividend and why not have 100% retention? That's a good question. I mean, I think the answer is that we we have very strong cash flow, so we can really do a bit of both, right? So, and the, uh, I went through those priorities, you know, organic investment or investment behind organic growth, investment behind acquisitions, and then the dividend. So, you know, that's really the order of, of capital allocation within the business at a high level. So, uh, and I think, the track record of dividend growth, I think, is important to us. It's important that we that we acknowledge that we should give you know cash returns to shareholders, and I think it's a very important signal to the market for uh, as to the health of the business overall as well. So, um, and you know, if we were perhaps domiciled in a different uh, in a different location, then perhaps we wouldn't pay a dividend. You know, U.S. companies tend not to quite so much, um, but we we certainly see. You know uh, that the, that in the UK that signal and that cash return is very much welcomed by our shareholder base overall. And as I say, we have the capacity to do it whilst investing in the business and keeping our leverage low. Okay, thank you. Um, next question: Where do you see the growth in profits coming from? Is it likely to be coming from sectors or products? Maybe they're both. Uh, yeah, I, I think <laughs> quite sure how to answer that one. I mean it. The, the 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 growth i think is it, i'll go back to those fundamental growth drivers in the business you know both regulatory and demographic um so it is about you know the growing market opportunities that we see um the growth in our addressable markets that's driven by as i say those demographic growth drivers growing populations urbanizing populations aging populations and then the ever tighter regulation whether it's in fire in medical and environmental i think we're all aware that uh, that the governments around the world are tightening regulations in each of those areas um you know um and we see a, an ever rising tide really so the growth i think will come from the growth we see in our addressable markets and our ability to grow with those markets and, and hopefully exceed the growth in those markets. Okay. Um, on the board structure, why did Halmer decide it needed to appoint a new chairperson? Yeah, well, I, I think Paul, Paul Walker had been our chair, uh, well, still is our chair, but just about to retire from, from, from Halmer. He'd been there for eight years. So it is typical for a UK company to to uh, for for a board member to stay for a maximum of nine years, uh, and if they stay for longer, they're deemed to be non-independent. So it was it was probably time to 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 find a new chair, and we were very lucky to find Dame Louise Makin, who has a great track record of of uh, both as an executive and a non-executive director in 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 business. Uh, of of helping companies grow and of making sure that we've got the right the right governance and processes at the board level around that. So we're very very pleased to get her, and her experience is obviously highly relevant to how much she has a great mix of experience in both in industry uh, and in, 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 sorry excuse me in in industrial sectors, uh, but also of running a medical business uh, BTG where she grew that business from being. I think about 150 million dollars of market cap to to uh, to four billion dollars of market cap, so um, so you know a great growth track record and great experience that we look forward to uh, to benefiting from. I would say this upvoting is interesting. I was just about to ask a question on divesting a subsidiary when a, when a, another vote comes in for something else. So that will have to wait a second. Okay. Um, Earnings growth at Halma has been strong for many years, but seems to have slowed in the last three years to the low teens level. Should investors regard that as a sustainable growth rate for the future? Yeah, as I say, we aspire to, to double the size of the company every five years, which would be a 15% compound annual growth rate. Uh, we're doing about 12. Um, so I think that's probably a, a, a reasonable assumption. Certainly what the, you know, if you asked an analyst what we were capable of delivering, I think they'd, they'd look for that kind of level over the next uh, two, three years, and, and hopefully for longer than that as well. But they tend not to forecast further out than that, as you probably know. So uh, uh, the minimum KPIs, as you may have seen if you've looked at our annual report that we set ourselves, 
are to deliver 5% organic and 5% acquired growth. Uh, we don't always meet those in every year, but we're looking at longer term averages. Those are the, the, the minimum levels that we'd look to achieve. And obviously we're doing better than those minimum KPIs. We're not quite meeting our aspiration for 15% growth, um, but we're, uh, we're nicely between the two, if I can put it that way. Okay. Uh, we've heard a little bit about your criteria for acquisitions. What is the criteria to divest a subsidiary and how often is this done? Yeah, so we're probably making sort of four or five acquisitions in it, in an average year. Um, it can be a bit lumpy. So uh, if I go back um, to not this financial year, but the previous financial year, we actually made 10 acquisitions. Um, this year, we've only done one. So I guess we're sticking to our average of about five. On the on the divestment side, we're probably selling a business a year on average, but again, it's it's lumpy. And why would we do that? Well, in the case of Fiber Guide, which is our most recent divestiture, which we 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 made uh, we sold that business in December, there were really two driving factors behind that. The first was that we saw the growth prospects for that business being increasingly outside that core purpose that you see on the screen there. Of, of a safer, cleaner, healthier future. So a lot of the growth that we saw come in the future wouldn't be wouldn't fall within safer, cleaner, or healthier. So um, so it was becoming increasingly or likely to become increasingly unaligned to that core purpose that we have. And the second reason was that we saw a lot of that growth would require you know a fairly significant amount of capital for the growth that we came out. And I mentioned earlier in the presentation that we are you know, a relatively capital light business. So spending a lot of capital behind that growth didn't seem like the right thing to do. So we decided that that business would be better in someone else's hands. Okay. Um, looking across now towards China, given a significant business in China, how concerned are you at the increasing tensions between China, the US and the UK and possibly Europe as well? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously something we monitor, but uh, I think it's important to recognize that Halmer's businesses are seen as being really quite local. Um, so, you know, we have a local management team in China. Uh, our companies are, you know, staff with local people. So it isn't, it isn't an expat business, if I can put it that way. And I think that does help us reduce the, the, the tensions there. But we have had to deal um, a little bit, and it's not hugely material for the group, you know, for example, with US-China tariffs. And I come then back to, for example, you know, so there have been challenges around that. And then I come back to actually the agility that Halmer's companies have, because we're quite small in dealing with those, in dealing with those sorts of challenges. We find ways of working around those challenges and keeping, keeping the companies going, growing over time that uh, that, uh, that 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 have sustained us very well so far so it is it's it's not really been an issue uh, as yet but it is obviously something that we'll continue to monitor great looking now towards the balance sheet do you have a gearing target and how does this affect your m a prospects yeah we, we do have a we, we talk about a maximum level of leverage within with it, or gearing within the balance sheet so we talk about a maximum two times net debt to EBITDA um, the reality is that if you look over the last 10 years we've probably never been higher than about one and a half times so we're well within that uh, you know what is a fairly conservative target in itself and actually, if you talk to Mark Ronchetti, our finance director, he would say that given the very strong cash generation that we have within the business, we're probably never more than, I know, 12 or 18 months away from actually having no debt at all on a net basis. So it's, um, it is a fairly conservative target. We keep plenty of firepower available within the balance sheet. And that allows us to buy those small privately owned companies that we want to purchase in those uh, those markets that are contiguous that are adjacent to our our existing markets uh you know when they become available and the 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 only challenge really or one of the challenges of buying companies that are you know privately owned is you never know when they're going to become available especially companies that we want to buy which are uh, good strong performing strongly performing companies so it makes sense to keep lots of firepower on the balance sheet so when they do become available we can go and purchase them and not worry about the leverage impacts on the balance sheet overall we keep a pretty conservative leverage profile. Okay. 
Thank you. We've got a few more minutes left. We've got some time for some more questions. So a few uh, still open, which we'll try and address. And I'll just remind you as well, if you are going to or do want to attend the Signet after meeting, there's a link in the Q&A box. There's also a link on the ShareSoc uh, uh, page. Um, but anyway, the link is on there if you haven't seen it already and want to take a copy of that, that will give you access to the Signet after meeting meeting. Um, now to the next question, how much autonomy um, does each subsidiary have in, in terms of its strategy and execution? Um, when does the central uh, head office team step in and uh, under what circumstances? Yeah, I mean, each of our companies is, is fairly autonomous and we like to keep it that way because we think those boards of directors who who sit in, in each of the companies, you know, who manage those companies are the best placed people to, to deal with the challenges in their marketplace. Um, so, you know, we, 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 there is obviously a control framework around, around that, um, but actually we give as much freedom and entrepreneurialism to those companies as, as we can, and we reward them for the, the, the growth that they deliver. Uh, so our, our um, remuneration is based on an EVA basis for those companies. So annual bonuses are paid on the growth that those companies deliver over, the, over and above the cost of capital. So they get a capital charge and, and the profit that they deliver above that is, uh, is a determining factor in their bonus. Basically, it's as simple as that. So we keep them entrepreneurial. Uh, we allow them to, you know, autonomy to do what they see as best for their particular marketplace. And given the diversity of what we do as a business, uh, that makes sense. So there's no way that we can, we can know best at the center how 41 or 42 individual marketplaces might work. So that, that, that makes sense. I think um, you, that being said, we of course monitor the, the results of those companies very closely. Um, we get weekly and monthly submissions in from those companies in, in, in quite a lot of detail. Um, and you know, clearly if we, if we see, uh, if we see the, the financial per performance not being what we would like it to be, then we'll start asking questions around that about that you know is it a management misstep is it something changing in the marketplaces and we'll take appropriate action depending on 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 what the answers are to those questions so but generally our, our philosophy if you like is to make sure that the companies have the the maximum possible flexibility to grow their businesses over the long term uh, this now seems sort of a, a linked uh, question. So bearing in mind your 40 plus autonomous companies in different sectors, how exactly do you go about achieving the convergence part of your strategy? Yeah, I think it comes back to the collaborative culture that we have uh, fundamentally. So um, I think because everyone knows what they're responsible for and accountable for at Halma, and you know, we do hold people accountable for performance, um, that that there is actually you know a fairly low level of politics and a fairly high level of collaboration within the businesses so um and i, I think our um our companies recognize the value in, in 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 collaborating between because the technologies often overlap between the companies and the markets are fairly contiguous um, we reinforce that by having groups of companies being chaired by what we call divisional chief executives, DCEs, to use the, the three-letter acronym. Um, and they'll chair groups of companies. Like we'll have a chair, for example, for our half a dozen water companies. Um, and they, they will act as a, a, as a non-executive chairman, you know, helping the company direct their organic and acquisition-led strategies uh, overall. Um, and obviously that you know, when they're they're chairing a number of companies in a contigu in contiguous markets, adjacent markets, then 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 actually it's pretty easy to bring together the ideas, and then obviously that is bound together by our sector chief executives who manage the the broader sectors overall, and it's reinforced by technology as well. So we have um, uh, a system, for example, called Halma Hub, which is a little bit like Facebook for Halma, if I can put it that way, uh, where we share ideas. Um, ask questions, and that's used by well over half of our employees uh, to, to to do that. So, and a, a great sort of sharing tool um, to uh, to 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 capitalise on growth opportunities and to overcome the sort of challenges and problems that come up day to day in business. Okay, 
Uh, we've got a question on COVID here. What, what effect, if any, has COVID had on Helmer's performance now and, uh, and in the future? Well, you can see um, that, that, you know, it did have an impact in the first half of the year, albeit relatively modest. So revenues and profits were down 5%, um, half on half. Um, we are recovering pretty quickly, though. So the fact that we're going to deliver a similar profit, uh, if you believe our guidance, uh, uh, to, 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 to what we delivered last year tells you that actually we're recovering fairly, fairly well in the second half of the year. I think we have we are still seeing a fair disparity of performance across our businesses you know some businesses for example in elective surgery providing products for elective surgery things like uh, eye surgeries and spinal surgeries for example you know those have been affected because actually just not so many of those surgeries are being done because healthcare systems are very focused on on, on addressing covid and not not addressing some of those longer term medical issues that can wait a bit uh, if I can put it very simply like that. At the other end of the spectrum, actually continuing with medical, you know, the ventilator and vital signs businesses, the, the businesses that monitor, that help help our customers monitor, you know, cardiac function and blood pressure, for example, have done very well during COVID. So there's a big disparity in the portfolio and a, probably a larger than usual disparity between the top performers and the bottom performers. But over time, we'd expect that to compress back to much more normal levels, I think. So, um, and, and we're already seeing those trends being fairly apparent. Okay. Um, again, looking at the uh, acquisitions, are acquired companies rebranded or do they keep their original names? No, they, they keep their, their names. They may well add a Halmer company at the bottom right-hand corner of their website, for example. But uh, yeah, you know, one of our larger companies, for example, Apollo, which is a fire detection business, uh, based down near Portsmouth um, is very much called Apollo. And if you look on its website, I think it will say a, a Helmer company um, below that. But uh, but no, we, we keep the brands. Um, so it's important that they have those, those individual brand uh, areas. And it's actually one of the areas that we help our companies with um, uh, brand and marketing as part of our strategic communications team is, is a key area in helping those SMEs have really good um, brand and marketing presences, both online and offline. And again, on the acquisitions, how do you source those, uh, those acquisitions? They tend to be found actually through the companies and through the DCEs that chair the companies. You know, clearly we, 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 we get, gather ideas from all over um, and we do speak to banks and brokers, but often the, the, the opportunities come through our knowledge of the markets and the people we interact with in those markets. Um, you know, it might be through a trade show, might be because we've seen them present in our marketplace in different geographies. Um, so that's the way we build up our pipeline, principally through the knowledge of the people who are operating at the front line, if you like, in our companies. Um, and um, you know they, they they will they will find a company and they'll say well I think this should be you know part of Halmer it looks like a very good company it's performing well it has the right characteristics the right culture the right financial performance and financial metrics and then obviously we we then look at it start doing our due diligence and and ultimately whilst we're very selective we may well go and buy that business but really it's very much a bottom up process in terms of M and A sourcing. Okay, uh, and I'm going to jump down one question here because um, it's linked to that. You said that acquisitions are in contiguous areas and quite small. What is the typical market cap that you buy? It's well, I think the biggest one we bought has been about 130 million pounds. Um, the smallest ones, you know, just a few hundred thousand pounds. Um, so it is, it is a bit of a range. But given that we're capitalised at nine billion roughly currently. You know, none of these are, are particularly large transformative acquisitions. Um, they tend to be, as I say, you know, relatively small privately owned companies which have those strong long term growth prospects and fit well into the Helmer culture. OK, um, what constrains your growth? I think probably the. <laughs> The, the availability, ultimately the availability of good talent to drive the growth, I think. Um, so, you know, making sure that we, we have good talent that, that is aligned with that, that collaborative entrepreneurial Halmer culture is probably the sort of biggest governor. Um, so we're not, we're not short of capital as we've talked about. Um, 
you know, getting the opportunities on board from an M&A perspective, you know, we've got plenty in the pipeline. Obviously, we have to wait for those to mature, if you like, and, and to be available. Uh, and that is one governing factor. But I think ultimately, it's, a, it's about having the breadth of talent and the depth of talent in the business. And that probably is the, the biggest governing factor uh, overall. The, I would say, though, also on the organic side, you know, clearly what we're looking for is long term compounded growth and returns out of the business. So healthy returns compounding over many years and, and strong compounding growth at the top line. Um, you know, we're not looking to, to push that in any one particular year. Um, it, it, it's all about that long term growth prospects within the business. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think that's important to recognize in terms of being a, a governing factor, a balance of growth and returns and appropriate investment in the business, you know, really compounding over the long term. Excellent. Charles, you've done a fantastic job answering these questions. Uh, we've got time for one more. And in fact, we've got one more. So I'll Excellent. ask the last question now. Does Helma pay cash or equity for the acquisitions? Uh, cash is the answer. I mean, equity is very expensive, especially Halma equity. So the answer is cash. We've got plenty of cash. We've got, you know, uh, as I mentioned at the half year stage, we had nearly half a billion of available li liquidity. So it, it, it's cash. Um, we do from time to time also um, put earnouts in there as well. So that's a uh, that that is a uh, that is an option for us. But basically, we don't pay pay an equity. Brilliant. Charles, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you so much for answering those questions, all of them so, so well. Thank you for everyone asking because you've uh, managed to fill up the time perfectly. So um, just a reminder now that a recording of presentation will be available um, on the website uh, shortly after, um, after this webinar finishes. Please provide feedback. Uh, there's a link in the follow-up email, but also as you exit, there'll be a, a, a survey that will come up on screen. I know uh, Charles and uh, Sharesock and Yellowstone very much appreciate that feedback. So if you could uh, complete that, that would be great. There are a number of future events uh, organized by both Sharesock and Yellowstone Advisory coming up over the coming weeks. Details are on the screen now, and you can also find them um, at the website addresses at the bottom. So. I'll just hand back to Charles to, uh, to, well, I'll say thank you to Charles and then hand back just to, for him to say goodbye. And uh, we hope to see you all soon. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And um, uh, uh, Alex mentioned, uh, you know, the, the questions. It's always easy to answer questions when they're good quality questions coming in. So thank you very much for that. Really appreciate that. Um, we all hope to repeat it and, and give you a good update about how much success in the future um, in, in the not too distant future as well. So we'll try and do these a couple of times a year um, just to, to keep you update with our, up to date with our progress. So thank you very much indeed for listening. As I mentioned at the beginning, if you do have specific questions, then do drop me an email at charles.king at halma.com. Uh, and with that, back to Alex. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you all soon.